It was the failure of an anticipated inflation to materialize. It is exactly the feeling you get when you walk up the steps in the dark and put your foot on a step that isn't there. You've probably heard that we are entering a multi-year era of higher interest rates and higher inflation. But do you know why specifically? Well, today, economist William White explains why we are moving from an age of abundance into an age of scarcity. Bill is an accomplished economist who has served at the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of International Settlements, and the OECD, where he was the chairman of the Economic and Development Review Committee. I'm Ed D'Agostino. Thanks for joining me for another Global Macro Update. Bill, I've been really looking forward to this conversation because I know you and I, we share a concern about interest rates and inflation remaining, if not high, certainly higher than they were pre-COVID, which seems like a real simple sort of thesis, but the, the, the reasons behind this are, are highly complex. And I touched on one recently talking about how the need for the U.S. to become more resilient is going to result in some inflation, some pain. And then you followed up in an email to me saying that there's actually five important drivers behind this. And if you would be kind enough to take us through those five, that would set the stage for, I think, what's going to be a great discussion. Well, Ed, thank, thank you for inviting me today. I'm, I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, yeah, my, my concern is that um, pe- people are far too short-sighted when they start thinking about inflation and what the problems are likely to be. And it's all to do at the moment with sort of the near-term what's going to happen to wage growth in the services sector, you know, these kinds of issues, which are very important. I don't deny that they're very important, but there are some deeper, more secular issues that I think also need to be thrown into the mix. And as you you said, um, I think there are at least five, five grounds and p- potentially more for believing that we've we're going we we've been through an age of plenty and we're actually going to move into an age of austerity and i know it doesn't seem like we've been through an age of plenty because a lot of people didn't get the benefit but when you look at the underlying trends that i guess richer people have somehow monopolized the benefits but when you look at the underlying trends uh we have in fact been living through an age of plenty And I can give you at least five good reasons for thinking so. I mean, one of them is globalization. You know, it's had an incredible impact in terms of um, reducing prices, increasing the availability of things. Uh, China uh, coming into the global trading system was very important. But the, 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 how can I say, the fall of the wall, Eastern Europe, uh, India, all of those things contributed to the the process of globalization, which which has been really important over the course of really since 19, 1990, I guess, with Xi Jinping and the euro. And, you know, that, that's how I date the be- beginning of the globalization thing. It's been very important. Um, second thing that happened sort of in this whole period leading up to, well, I'd say around 2019, so the, the year of plenty let's say, from 1990 through until COVID, let's say. Uh, The second big thing was demographics. And uh, my friend Charles Goodhart, my first boss at the Bank of England, has written a whole book with his colleague Prahad called The Great Economic Reversal, in which he talks about the early period and then what comes after. And I'll talk about that in a moment too. But the, the point is that we had the baby boomers coming through, We had urbanization in China. We had increases in women partition in the workforce. Um, All sorts of reasons why the demographics were were favorable to people being being productive in the workforce. So that was the second thing about the the era of plenty. The third thing was environmental. Um, And I would say that it was a positive period, but we didn't worry about it. You know, there there was a doubling of energy demand. Uh, during that period, and yet prices didn't sort of rise astronomically. 
the the industry managed to sort of pull out the coal and the gas and the oil and 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 everything was 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 fine um then we had the whole question of production processes i think an unparalleled period where people were just focused like a laser on efficiency of production also the globalization played into it efficiency of supply chains um um so we 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 had all all of that um and it was all positive and then we had the technology you know like you can't forget about the fact that you know the internet was essentially invented uh, moore's law the price of processing and storing data went you know just down like a like a, a rock um all of these things contributed to prosperity and low prices disinflation and i believe that all of these things are going into reverse um so when you look at the deglobalization is going to be replaced by deglobalization you know if you read i don't have to say much about that you read the newspapers we have no we have no idea how far this is going to go uh, both janet yellen and um um Mr. Sullivan suggested a while back that national security was the absolute number one priority. So who knows what the cost of the sacrifice will be? We simply don't know. The demographics, I mentioned that book, The Great Demographic Reversal. Uh, the urbanization is finished. Uh, the baby boomers have gone through. Uh, the number of workers is declining uh, in virtually every country in Europe. Um, in uh, the, the, the U.S., aside from immigration, um, Japan, Korea, China, uh, the world global labor supply of those workers that are part of the, the, the global process is all declining. So that's gone into reverse. Uh, the environment, and I think the environment is just a huge issue. Um, we now absolutely have a constraint um, as you look forward, um, whether it's adaptation, you know, accepting the reality of climate change, or whether it's mitigation, doing something about it, it's going to be very expensive. And um, if you think, for example, just about the costs of it proceeding, there have been a number of recent studies that show that the costs of climate change, negative costs in terms of, I'm not talking about doing anything about it. I'm talking about if it happens, how much will it cost through sort of destroyed ports, destroyed sort of sewage and transit systems, you know, violent weather, rising, rising oceans, all of this stuff is going to be extremely costly. And some of the recent studies, stuff just come out in the last month or two. I mean, there's a, a study here that I was just looking at by Bilal and Kanzig, the macro, macroeconomic impact of climate change. They conclude that a 1% increase in temperature is going to cut global GDP by 12%, 12 percentage wow. points. Okay? Wow. So 12%, I'm sorry. These are really, really big numbers. And there's two or three other studies, and I won't go into the details, that all seem to point point to the fact that the estimates that we've seen thus far are, are vastly, uh, vastly underestimate the overall cost of this happening. It's going to be a huge negative supply shock. Uh, on the producer produ production processes, it's the same thing. You know, people are sort of backing off efficiency. Your stuff about resilience, okay? They're starting to realize now that they, they they can't carry on in the same way. They're just not it's not safe enough. Then you add the national security stuff and the deglobalization on top. So we've got all of this stuff coming down the road. And um, on the technology, which is, I guess, the fifth of the things that I've been worried about, um, I was actually surprised. McKinsey Global Institute recently came out with a big study that basically said they think um, they think the the low hanging fruit has been has been picked, and if you look at somebody like um, well the World Bank for example, you know you look at their medium term projections. Um, basically, what they're saying is that um, 
productivity growth has been falling, and they are confidently predicting it will continue to fall. So all of this stuff, um, you know, that was so positive in the past isn't going to be there. So on the supply side, I'm saying we are going from good times to times that are going to be much tougher, okay? The second aspect that I don't think gets anywhere enough, near enough attention is that those negative supply shocks are going to arrive at the same time as positive demand shocks, okay? Now, let me take you through how I see that. Um, over the, the last 20, 30 years or so, um, we've actually been pretty fortunate on the, inve- the, the needs for investment were not so great. And they weren't so great in large part because wages were low. So you didn't have to have capital expansion to increase your production. You just relied on people on people who were available and not so well paid. So that was something that we sort of really, really benefited from. And um, I think that is going to change in the future. So when you start thinking about but now people are not readily available to work. We're going to have to have um, capital to replace them. Well, what that means is we're going to need more investment to replace workers that aren't there. So that's one thing that's going to go into reverse. When you think about the investment requirements associated with deglobalization, which you've touched on, resilience in your systems. We're going to have to have investment at home to replace the investment that once took place abroad. And then you start thinking about the environment, okay? The, 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 so each one of those negative supply shocks almost automatically calls for a big and positive investment response in turn. So when I talked about the cost of climate change before, okay, negative supply side shock, you have to... <laughs> you could just live with it, right? You could just live with it, not do anything. But I don't, when you look at all the numbers, it makes absolutely no sense to do that. Yeah. It's interesting you say that too. Bill, I had dinner um, a couple of years ago with uh, Francis Suarez, who at the time uh, was, was the mayor of Miami. And he was talking about how that's, from his perspective, doing nothing is not an option because his city will become unlivable uh, in, in a matter of a few short decades. So it's, yeah. it's interesting, right? No matter where you fall in the political spectrum, he was, he's a Republican. He's saying, look, I, I live it. I see it every day. Miami's going to get washed away unless there's a huge investment made. Absolutely. And so these studies that I was referring to before, uh, most of them really talk about what's the cost of letting climate change rip and what's the cost of doing something about it. And when you look at the numbers, the cost of doing something about it is huge, but the cost of not doing something about it are, are vastly higher. Okay. So it's that kind of, you, you don't want to be in this situation of having to do something, but we do have to do something. So what I'm suggesting is that the sort of the relatively weak investment picture in the past that we could put up with, okay, that's not going to be the case in the future. Those investment requirements to deal with demographics, deglobalization, and climate change are going to be huge. And then in addition, we have the guns and butter problem. So in the age of plenty, Okay, that was that was when we were all getting the military dividend, right? And we didn't have to do much for sort of poor folk because we all believed in the trickle down theory. Well, it ain't like that anymore. So when you look at the military side, it's the very opposite, right? You can see it now, you can see it in Europe, you can see it everywhere. Everybody is starting to rearm, and that's going to be very expensive. Now, how far it has to go, I have no idea, but it will be very expensive. And then you get on to the butter issues, okay? So before, we didn't worry too much about, you know, redistribution stuff because, 
you know, life was reasonably good. But now we've gotten to a point where there's a lot of angst and there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of recognition. I mean, in the UK, for example, you know, there's been a massive cutback in, in welfare support and stuff like that. And starting to realize that the costs of that are far greater than you had originally anticipated. So all of all of that stuff. So I've got all these five negative supply side shocks. I've got these two really important positive demand side shocks, which is investment, both public and private, okay? and the guns and butter stuff, okay? which is going to have to be dealt with. So when you put all that together, this goes right back to the first to the question when you started. What does this mean for interest rates? What does this mean for inflation? What does this mean for interest rates? And to my mind, I just find it very hard to believe that this is not going to be very inflationary over an extended time period, and that that will have implications for the conduct of monetary policy, and that interest rates in that environment of continuous and extended shocks, you will need to have tighter money in order to prevent, on top of all those difficulties, a kind of needless wage price spiral that will eventually benefit nobody. So I think when I talk about, I think we're going from an age of plenty to an age of scarcity, and we have not focused on these secular issues, um, I don't think we're doing ourselves any favors. Um, and in fact, I mean, I don't want to be overly biblical, but I mean, if one had uh, read the, um, what is it, the parable of the seven fat cows and the seven lean cows in the Old Testament, you remember that, that story where Pharaoh's dream gets interpreted by Moses. He says, There's, you're going to have seven fat years in the land of Egypt, followed by fat, <laughs> seven lean years. And Pharaoh says to Moses, start building the silos. <laughs> and unfortunately, <laughs> we haven't. So I think we should be thinking rather more seriously about some of these really deep secular problems that are coming down the road. I certainly hope they're not. But uh, it seems to me that the probability of my being correct is 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 high enough that one should at least be thinking about mitigation, resilience. What are you going to do when the time comes? We've talked in the past about Keynes and, and how his thinking factors a lot into into how you're looking at this. I mentioned, I think, in, before the recording started, that uh, in a way I was sort of motivated by Keynes's tract that he wrote in 1941, which is called How to Pay for the War in a Socially Just Way. And I think what we should be thinking about is precisely that, because we are in a kind of war. We're in a war to preserve our market-based capitalist democratic system uh, in an environment that is going to be very, very difficult to navigate. So Keynes would say that in good times, the government should put money away yeah. and that in bad times, the government should be there to help the economy get back on its feet, spend so that uh, it, it, it accelerates the recovery. Precisely. He gets, he gets so demonized. His thinking is so demonized because mm. everyone forgets about the first part of his equation. Why, why do you, I, this is a tangent, but why do you think that is? Oh, shucks. I think because it's so hard to do, and this is the fundamental problem in a way at the macro level. If you look back over the last 30, 40, maybe even longer years, is that when we've done the easing, okay, when you've run into a recession or something of that nature, you ease monetary policy and you ease fiscal policy, but you never reverse the you never reverse the movements as much there's been a fundamental asymmetry and what's that meant is recession after recession the interest rates during the age of plenty ratcheted down because it was so much easier to lower them than it was to raise them and it's exactly the same thing in the government deficit side 
that what should have been, what government should have been doing was when the economy sort of went into an expansionary phase, they should have been trying to run surpluses that matched the deficits. Now, albeit accounting for the differences that you were on a sort of positive growth track, you, you hoped, okay? Which may now, as I say, be coming to 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 an end, but they should have there should have been much more symmetry in the policy responses, and there weren't. And now, and this is really the heart of the matter, is that whereas in the past, when things turned down, you could simply ease monetary and ease fiscal, now we've got huge problems. Um, of doing that, particularly on the, we've now got a bit more room on the monetary side to to ease if things turn tough. But on the fiscal side, um, we're starting off with such huge debts, both public and private, that when I start talking about the need for consistently higher interest rates over an extended period, any thoughtful person has to say, to start with, what's that going to mean for the private sector and, and financial stability? And when I start talking about higher interest rates for the government that's already heavily indebted, the question of what does that imply for debt service requirements for the governments going forward? So because we didn't do the right thing over the last 20 or 30 years, that we were not prudent enough, indeed, perhaps even imprudent in certain respects, we now find ourselves in a place where we don't want to be. You know, we're facing all of these requirements, um, a lowered potential to produce stuff on the supply side, and yet an increased demand for investment, implying, and you don't need to be a rocket scientist, Okay, if aggregate supply is going <laughs> going down and aggregate demand is going up because of investment, there's only one thing left that can square the circle, and that's consumption. And that becomes politically extremely difficult. And that's where you get into the question of what are the broader implications of trying to, to deal with these problems. So um, we really... we. We really do have some difficult circumstances to deal with going forward. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but these are secular forces that are already in train and will continue for an extended period of time. And there should be more thought going into that and how we deal with it than is going into it, in my judgment. Yes, and you and you've made it clear in past writings and speeches that this is a highly complex situation. Um, that that simple simple fixes aren't going to work here, and yet in the U.S., stock market is near near all time highs. I I don't know how many times we've hit an all time high this year, but it's been many times. Um, the market remains elevated. For, from the investor's perspective, times are good, and um, politicians are funded primarily by people who are investors or, or, or the extremely wealthy. So I don't hear any U.S. politicians giving real airtime. I think I heard one nod in a speech recently where, where, where one of the presidential candidates mentioned the debt in passing, maybe all of three seconds uh, in, a, in a long speech. No one's talking about this. To me, although I guess I have been worried about this range of territory for, for many, many years, uh, the Liz Truss episode, I have I spent a lot of time in the UK, and the Liz Truss episode really sort of hit me. And there were, there were two elements of it. it the, the first element was when they came down with this wildly imprudent budget. Uh, that the, and. and which they had not passed through normal channels. You know, the, the cabinet hadn't heard about it. The, 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 the budget office hadn't heard about it. They just sort of did it. And it was in itself imprudent. And the way they did it was imprudent. 
And the gilts market went mad. And there was a huge spike in, in bond yields. And then the Bank of England had to, well, that was step one, number one. Step number two was that that big increase in gilt in, in gilt edged um, interest rates had enormous implications for pension funds that had followed investment strategies using derivatives. And what happened was that there was a huge call for margin. And the only way that they could do it, the only way they could get the cash was by selling more gilts. And gilts oh, were already wow. in free fall. You get the picture. They, this yes. is a complex a death spiral. <laughs> and a kind of death spiral. And the Bank of England, even though they were committed to quantitative tightening, had to go in and expand their balance sheet to buy still more gilts to stabilize the situation. Well, in the end, they did it. They did a good job. Things went more or less back to normal. The prime minister got sacked, basically. Um, but the, the point that I'm making is that this is a big, quote unquote, well-run country that suddenly was at the edge of a problem. Within what, two weeks? Oh, shucks. Yeah, a week, two weeks. I mean, this is, of course, this is the yes. characteristic of jo John Malden's always going on about the, you know, complex systems and sand piles and stuff. Right. Everything is fine right. until in these complex systems, everything is fine until it isn't. Yeah. And, and the unraveling, I mean, and we've, we've seen this. I mean, I can remember econometric studies years and years ago about Garch processes. And basically what it meant was when the stock market, and this is traditional, the data goes back for hundreds of years. When the stock market goes up, it generally goes up in a relatively sort of calm way for an extended period of time. But when it falls, it's bang, you know. And a lot of these systems tend to have that characteristic. And the decline can come out of nowhere. I mean, in, I'm thinking about 1921, there was a huge recession in both Britain and in the United States. Jim Grant's written a whole book about it. And there was um, a famous economist, and his name is now going to escape, escape me, who, when he tried to describe what happened, he said, quote, unquote, it was like, it was the failure of an anticipated inflation to materialize. It is exactly the feeling you get when you walk up the steps in the dark and put your foot on a step that isn't there. <laughs> it's just beautiful mm -hmm. stuff. But that's the way these systems work. And the, the problem is that as long as things are going good, this is back to your resilience point, you know, but it applies much, much more broadly than just inventories. You know, as long as times are going good, People expect them to continue to be good, and they won't be. And we know this over and over again. We've seen this so many times in history that all of a sudden stuff stops. And, um, well, Larry Summers years ago got off a wonderful line at a meeting in Prague. One, two, three, what comes next? And the answer is four, because it's obvious. And then he said, no, it could be three. Because the best predictor of tomorrow is always today. So it could be two. Because uh, in the end, everything reverts to the mean. And not so fast, it could be one. Because everything that goes around, comes around. Mm. And <laughs> there's a terrible tendency on the part of everyone, governments and private sector, to say the world works one, two, three, four. But it really works sometimes two and sometimes one. And we give very little thought to these issues. And um, I guess it's because nobody gets, what's the word? Gov governments don't get reelected for avoiding bad outcomes. You know, so they, they do stuff and all that's noted is, boy, that's costing a lot of money. So, I mean, on the military side, there's, a, there's an expression I wish I could do the Latin, but I forget it. But the English translation is, if you want peace, prepare for war. And the UK wasn't prepared, nor the US for that matter, wasn't prepared prior to World War I. 
then they made the same mistake by not being prepared for World War II. And I guess people are now sort of kicking themselves a bit, saying maybe we're not prepared for what's coming down the road. You know, just keep making these mistakes over and over again. Let's talk a little bit about some of the potential consequences from all of this bill. There's some potentially good consequences, I guess. If you're if you're an investor, there might be some pockets of investing, like automation, that 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 you'll do well in. But there's a lot of negative. I mean, you you mentioned. Um, the UK cutting back on social programs um, yeah. in Europe and in the UK, there's a, a more socialized form of medicine um, than we're from more familiar with in the U S what, what could happen in the healthcare space? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, um, the, the healthcare space, we talked before about demographics and I put the emphasis on these people used to be working and now they aren't working. But the other thing I didn't mention was they're also old sick people. Right. The demand for healthcare is just going to go through the roof. Yeah. And sort of the, you know, you start thinking about things like Alzheimer's. Um, you know, the, 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 the fact is that there's going to be a lot of people um, who are going to be in very ill health, who will need care. And the question is, how do you provide it? And of course, there's a big discussion in the UK at the moment. And there is in my own country, Canada, about uh, how do you improve the system that we've got? How do you increase efficiency? Not least of which through the the, the more fervent embrace of digital, digital technology, you know, to try to to deal with the problems that are coming down the road. And I think that's that's got to be a high priority everywhere to to in certainly in the U.S. I mean, the, the system that you've got, um, I mean, as you're as you're well aware just huge costs and uh, relatively little to show for it in terms of uh, mortality rates and baby mortality and, and all that kind of stuff. And insurance and administration, and it takes up so much of the overall. So I think if you talk about sort of what needs to be done, I would say that sort of improving efficiency of government uh, is, is got to be pretty high up on the list. Uh, you want to go in there and look very carefully about how you're doing things. On the tax side, I think there's 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 absolutely no question that taxes have to go up. And particularly in America, you've got much more room than in other countries. You know, the tax burden is already much higher. Um, if you said which taxes, I guess I'd I'd say property and uh, energy uh, would be high in my list. I'd want to go and look at tax expenditures, you know, very, very carefully. Um, in many countries, of course, you, you, you get, um, um, can I say the subs the subsidization of energy in a way that's, uh, really inappropriate. Um, but I, I, I notice, well, I mean, once, once you've done some of these things, it becomes extremely difficult to turn it around. I mean, you look at some of the problems that are going on in Nigeria right at the moment, which is, um, you know, really very, very difficult. So anyway, I mean, you'd have to look at you'd have to look at all of those things in terms of in terms of the government. I mean, in expenditures, um, I think got to be much more reliance on uh, means testing. So all of the universal programs, I think, should be looked at very, very carefully. Means testing. We have we have the digital capacity to do it. I mean, if the Indians can sort of, you know, provide identity cards and digital identities to a billion people, uh, we surely won't be able to rise to that challenge ourselves. Um, so all all of those things, um, I think, need to um, need to be done. Um, none of none of, none of the possible solutions to these problems are going to be easily done or are they going to be quickly done but at the very nor least nor are they going to be popular and nor will they be popular and so i think we have to think very we have to start talking about this as an issue coming down the road all of these things are coming together all of these supply shocks and all of these necessary investment requirements are all coming down together and the question is, what will be the implications for for prices and interest rates? And I think we know that. How do we mitigate the fallout? 
how do we try to gradually stabilize the situation so we can get back to some, so we can deal with the problems that we face in a reasonably sensible way. Um, I, um, I'm not Pollyannish about this. I mean, I, I absolutely understand that we're in a place, well, do, do, do you, you know that old joke about the guy who's lost in Ireland, he wants to go to Dublin. He's lost in tiny little lanes of Ireland and he sees an old fellow in the field and he says to him, I'm, I'm totally lost, I want to go to Dublin. And the old man says to him, well, sir, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> and the, the problem, and you know, and this is a characteristic of all these complex adaptive systems, is they're all path dependent, okay? You can't start from anywhere else except where you are. And it's important to look at where you are and where you're going and decide if where you are and where you're going is not to your liking, what are you going to do about it? And I guess my major worry, I mean, I can, I can see, I can see a way out as I, as I said before, sort of talking about, uh, you know, various steps that we can take to improve structural reforms in the economy, making it a lot easier. This is less true in the U.S. than in, in Europe and other places, making it a lot easier for people to go bankrupt in an orderly way, because there'll probably be a lot of that going down the road. You know, we really do need to work on legislation, administrative facilities. I've been saying this, and others have been saying this for decades. Um, there's all sorts of things that we can do to get through this. But a lot of people have to be convinced up front that this is necessary, okay? Because we talked earlier about why people don't tighten up in the good times, because it's easier not to. Well, to to really start tightening up now because it's bad times, is we have to convince people that this is the way we should be thinking about things. And there's sort of three groups of people that are crucial in all of this. And you've got to get the donkey's attention with respect to each of the three. And one of them is obviously the guy in the street, okay, who's going to bear a significant portion of the burden of adjustment of, of supply side getting poorer or getting rich less rapidly than they've gotten used to. Um, Ordinary voters have to be convinced that there's a problem and we have to vote for people that have got solutions. Um, the rich and the powerful have got to be convinced that they've got to take half a loaf as opposed to no loaf. Because if things get bad enough, there will be a form of revolution. You know, I, have you read Walter, Walter Siegel's book? Um Shucks, I can see the. I forgotten the name of it now, but it's um, it's all about distribution over the ages, and when the distribution becomes so mal distributed, okay, going back five thousand years, it ends in one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, okay, so that those who are rich and powerful will have to make perhaps even, I won't say great sacrifices for them. But what would be great sacrifices for others? Okay, we'll have we'll have to make a significant contribution in the interest of having half a loaf as opposed to no loaf, because that's where it'll end up if there's not compromise and the right things are not done. And then, lastly, you need politicians who are also prepared to look at it and say, "I have to do hard things." And I have to take the risk of not getting reelected. Okay, and these two things go together, right? The ordinary guy's got to get it, and the politicians have got to get it. To leadership. To, you know, it's a symbiotic process between the citizens and the leaders that we have a problem here, and we have collectively to try to deal with it. So I don't doubt that there's going to be a lot of political difficulties in selling the product. And one of the things that worries me is that absent the changes that are required to somehow muddle through this thing, we're going to choose other ways to do it. And one of the obvious ways, 
I don't think people will give up on mitigating climate change and worrying about national security. I think the demands there are so great and become so obvious that it will happen. Okay. But I do think that there's a reasonable probability that people will say, well, we don't have to pay for it. What we'll do is we'll just sort of print the money. And of course, you're all, we're already at a state. You know, as you start to think about the interest rates are higher and debt service is now going to be higher. And there's going to be not too willing a market to buy all of those government bonds in those circumstances. And so what happens traditionally is you've got the big expenditure requirement on the public side, but you just fall back into the central bank, right? Central bank buys the bonds. And that's just inflation. That's inflation tomorrow, if not inflation today. That's the Latin American solution. And it's a possible outcome, okay, to all of these problems. You just try to print your way out of it, and it won't work. It'll just add to the problems. Um, Another possibility, I was going to say that as the interest rates go up and the government's debt service problem becomes greater and greater, there will be a tendency, and it may come sooner rather than later, to go back to what they did at the end of World War II, which is financial repression, which is you, you, print enough, you print enough money to get the inflation rate up, but not wildly up. You know, we're talking, you know, higher digits than the digits we've got. And you use financial repression, various kinds of administrative controls over what pension funds can do, what banks can do, You dress it all up as prudential policy, but basically it's a way of saying the interest rates will be kept down by the forced buying of government debt. And you do that for a reasonable period of time. I think at the end of World War II, it took, I don't know, six or seven years where the debt ratio just went down like this. But in large part, one, because they had more growth, but also because they had more inflation. This time it will be more difficult because we're not set up for more growth. We're set up for less growth. And it was also a different time in in, in the world. The world pro- probably would not have the, the confidence in the U.S. dollar that maybe it did after World War II. Yeah. But having said that, the interesting thing, I mean, if you want to go back to the U.S., you read so much stuff about how the U.S. dollar is vulnerable Okay, because the debt problem is getting out of control in the U.S. and you're worried about this, you're worried about that. I mean, you know as well as I do that currency is a question of who's got the dirtiest shirt in the laundry. And when you look at some of the problems some of the other countries face, okay, Japan in particular, China, Europe has got very special problems, which I think they can manage. I certainly hope they can manage, but I think they can manage. But some of these other guys, um, compared to them, the, the, you know, the dollar looks good. And the dollar is still, whatever anybody says, it is the vehicle for international exchange and reserves. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I worry about the U.S. dollar, but I, I sort of worry about some of these other people as well which raises some interesting questions that we needn't get into today about what the implications will be for countries like China and Japan if the U.S. dollar continues strengthening and their currencies continue weakening. There's some, interest, there's some interesting questions there as well. So from a national security point of view, it might actually be a good thing. Uh, I, I don't know. It's too early to make a judgment. That's a good cliffhanger to end it on. That and that gives me a good excuse to to uh, badger you to come back and and have a follow up conversation. Well, I I hope I continue to be in good health and and uh, both eager and prepared to do so. So it's it's been a lot of fun, Ed. Thank you. Before you leave, I want to invite you to join my global macro update newsletter. This is a free service that comes out every Tuesday and Friday. I'll send you an email with my latest thoughts on geopolitics, economics, the markets, along with a link to the latest interview and a transcript. If you'd like to join us, 
hit the link in the description below or go to globalmacroupdate.com and join over 100,000 other Global Macro Update readers. I hope you join us. I'm Ed D'Agostino. Thanks for watching.